comments from last week's show. We talked about biking while black in Tampa and the Department of Justice community meeting on that matter. Well, today on Midpoint, our topic is Cuba. The Cuban flag was raised in the, at the Cuban Embassy in Washington, D.C. this morning for the first time in 54 years. Our guests in the studio to today to take your calls about this issue are Rayshana Black and Noelle Smith. Thanks so much for being on WMS Midpoint, Rayshana and Noelle. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm really uh, grateful that you're addressing this issue today. Well, I hope our listeners uh, think are grateful as well and call in. And here's the number to call if you'd like to join the conversation about Cuba, if you want to talk about your experiences with Cuba or what you hope, give us a call, 813-239-9663. You can also email your question or comment to dj at wmnf.org, and I'll read it on the air. You can text us at 813-433-0885. And people call, tend to call toward the end of the show, so if you want to get in soon, you can give us a call now. Let's begin with you, Rayshana. What's your connection to Cuba? My mother is um, Afro-Cuban, and uh, she, was, she was born in uh, uh, the Oriente, uh, Guantanamo. And she came here as a little girl with, with my grandparents. And my family eventually came, and I still have family there, aunts, uncles. And you have traveled there? I have, I'm sorry. I did travel in 2003 for uh, school. I was on a winter uh, winter school session with Amherst, and um, I was able to study Cuban culture, Cuban arts, um, and I also got a chance to visit my family, which was a great opportunity. So uh, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, how did you travel there? Was it? Uh, did you have to get a special permit? I actually did. I had to get a student permit, um, <laughs> and I had to travel through Mexico into Cuba. So um, even as a student, I wasn't able to directly go to Cuba. So um, it, but while being there, it was just an amazing experience. It was this, the culture, the the life, just the vibrancy of the city. It was, it's just um, an amazing opportunity. So uh, let's talk about the embargo that mm-hmm. keeps most people f- from going, or at least going freely, right. and the opening of diplomatic relations. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about the embargo and what's happening now? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm grateful because of a lot of things. Uh, my family sits on very um, opposite sides of, of what has been taught here, um, which was that things were different prior to the embargo. There were a lot of there were a lot more opportunities, but for uh, families like mine, there weren't a lot of opportunities, and there was a lot of uh, underlying racial issues going on, uh, which prevented my family from having equal opportunities. So the embargo. Um, as far as the U.S. relations was concerned, acted differently. You know, it had a had a different reaction or a different consequence as as far as my family was concerned. My family did receive an education because of the the changes that occurred prior to the embargo. So um, I am grateful now to have had the experience that my family had, and I'm I'm also grateful to have the opportunity to go back and just just have that leisure to go back. Not not necessarily saying, you know, I'm here to visit family, but just just to go, you know, just to have that establishment with uh, the United States, so. That, that's Rayshonda Black, Rayshonda Black, rather, and she's one of our guests. Our other guest is Noelle Smith. And Noelle, you work at the USF Graphic Studio, and you work with Cuban artists. What's your background with Cuba? What's your relationship with Cuba? Well, first of all, I'm, I actually work at uh, the USF Institute for Research and Art, which is graphic studio and artist studio and the Contemporary Art Museum. So um, I am curator of Latin American and Caribbean art at the Institute. Uh, my family history, unlike Rashada, I'm not Cuban, um, but my family um, had uh, a lot of interest in Cuba, a lot of business interests. And so um, one uncle was in Havana, and one uncle was in um, Puerto Padre, which is not far from where Rashana's family is from. And um, so my family went down there all the time. So my mother speaks Spanish. In fact, 
I always tell this little anecdote that the last time my mother was in Cuba, uh, she was five months pregnant with me. So I think that I got a little in utero uh, experience there because the first time that I went to Cuba in 1999, um, I really, like Roshana, really reacted very strongly to um, the ambiance there, the environment. Plus, I grew up um, going to Ybor City quite a bit, so I knew a lot about the culture of Cuba from, from Ybor City. So, uh, being at USF in 1999 was my first trip to Cuba, and so since then I've been, I've kind of lost track, but I've been maybe 20, 25 times um, since then. And uh, I've traveled on um, licenses from USF. Graphic Studio had a license. Um, I've traveled um, mostly on the General Researcher's License, which is a provision of the, um, of the OFAC uh, General License. So as a non-commercial academic researcher, I'm able to travel. I traveled once with the Florida Orchestra when they went down there a couple of years ago. I went for a translator's conference once. So there's many, many ways, legal ways, for people to travel to Cuba, uh, especially for academic or cultural uh, reasons. In the early days of your travels with USF, it might not have been as difficult, but then the Florida legislature did something in the last decade where it made it more difficult for state employees to travel. What happened? Yeah, and this is something that, that is on top of the embargo, and which is something which is something that no other state in the, in the United States deals with. So in 2006, the legislature passed a law called Ban on Travel to Terrorist States. And uh, it was passed unanimously by the, by the, um, by the legislature. And actually, it was in, in a sort of reaction to a spying scandal at FIU in Miami. There were a couple of um, professors there who were um, actually accused of spying for Cuba. So then that was the excuse for some hardliners and of course using the word terrorism um, really um, pushed that law through. So basically the law said that no state or private funds could be used for travel to to or from Cuba, any travel-related expenses by um, any employee of, of, of the state of Florida. So that included the SUS, the state university system, as well as employees of the state of Florida. So um, you can only imagine the kind of position that that put us into. Uh, speaking for USF, we had a really thriving um, research agenda in many, many different areas, uh, visual arts, but then you've got marine sciences, you've got medical anthropology, you've got sociology, I could go on and on and on about how many researchers there are at USF who are interested in, in all things Cuba. So there was a, uh, the ACLU mounted a suit uh, against the state immediately, um, and uh, the lead the lead plaintiff was the, um, the Senate, uh, faculty senate at FIU, but I was one of the plaintiffs. And so keeping in mind that there were those two provisions, uh, there was um, state money coming, uh, money coming from taxes, and then private money, which you think of as foundation grants and um, private donations and things like that. So we, we mounted a... a um, challenge to this, uh, and it took a while in Miami, you could imagine, um, but we did manage to get one provision, the private, uh, stayed for a while. But then it went through the courts, went through the courts, went up to Atlanta, we lost in Atlanta, um, and then finally it almost went to the Supreme Court, but they decided not to take it. Um, the effect of this law, you could only imagine on, on research. Uh, in the state of Florida. So it basically meant that if you're a faculty member, you could not be supported in any way whatsoever with your research. You, who, what graduate students studying Cuba would want to come to Florida to, in the state university system if they can't support your research? Um, couldn't take students, um, you know, student um, study abroad. You couldn't do that. 
So can't bring scholars, can't bring artists, all these different types of things. So, so really a devastating effect. So it's not just the embargo that it's imposed by Congress, but the Florida State Legislature exactly. is also Exactly. No, the embargo, the provisions of the embargo actually is, is it contracted under Bush, but then Obama opened it up again. Um, but the provisions of the embargo are quite generous in terms of academic research and academic travel. That's Noel Smith, where we also have our guest Rashana Black. And I want to give up the number because we're going to go to the phones in just a second. And you can join the conversation as well by calling 813-239-9663. You can also email your question or comment to dj at wmnf.org or text us at 813-433-0885. We have Nate in Madeira Beach on the air. Hi, Nate. Nate, are you there? All right, we'll give you a second. We're going we're gonna, to uh, put you back on hold, but uh, you should um, hang up. To turn off your radio and, and listen to the phone. We'll put you on the air in just a second, Nate. You, you can call in too, 813-239-9663. So both of you have traveled there. Rishana, uh, tell us, you know, uh, the culture of Cuba, why would people, why would Americans want to travel there? What is it about Cuba? You've been, you said you've been to the east, I think, of, of Cuba. You've been to Havana, maybe. Uh, what, why is it that Americans might want to have the ability to travel there? Um, I, I think it's I think it's um, like any place when, when uh, traveling that you don't typically necessarily get to go. You know, this is this is one country specifically on the planet that we have been restricted to going. So I think that that in and of itself is is a great opportunity to learn of um, people. You know, just just people, the culture, and have that first-hand understanding of what it is to to know this land and these people of this land. Um, I think that so many times we have had stories and we interpret those stories and we, you know, have, have built a perception around those stories, but to actually go and experience life there, the people there, the, the culture, um, you create your own interpretation. You, see, you create your own worldview about it. Um, I I love the culture, of course, because you know that's part, that's my culture. So um, I, I think there there's such a freedom about the expression of culture that is unique. I, I'm not suggesting by any means that no one else has that same freedom, but Cuban people have a freedom about their culture in in their in their music in their art and the way that they express themselves. Um, my favorite thing to do or to have done, and I think that my family does it all the time, but we just subconsciously didn't know, you know, as, as, uh, as we grew older and more removed from the, from the country, we have a thing on Sundays where we get together, there's music, there's dancing, but in Cuba it's the same thing. Like every Sunday there's this, there's this, uh, in Havana, they do um, a dance thing, and they have live drumming, and they have food. They have just they have a grand time, and I didn't realize the connection until I actually went. My family doesn't talk a lot about oh, this is the similarities. These are things are these are the things we've done there, and we brought them here. But to go there and to actually see the similarities is is amazing. So I would encourage anyone, you know, especially if you have Cuban friends, if you're you know, of Cuban descent or some sort of um, a link to Cuba, just the fact that we're 90 miles outside of it uh, from Key West, um, I think that that in and of itself is a reason to go, you know, to, ex to experience the people and the culture. All right, we're going to go to the phones now. We have... Um Let's see, Mary in Odessa, you're on the line. Hi, Mary. Do you have a question for our guests? But right now, uh, it seems to me there's this frenzy of go to Cuba now before things change. <laughs> um, and that, uh, you know, there's all kinds of packages. Of, it seems to me uh, higher prices than um, uh, I. Guess it should cost. I have no idea to be honest. But there seems to be this frenzy. I'm wondering. 
wondering what your guest uh, opinion of that is, and if there's uh, maybe uh, this kind of hysteria at the moment. Things change. Noel? Mm -hmm. I'm glad somebody asked that. <laughs> I'm glad that you asked it, mm -hmm. because um, uh, yes, a lot of people say, oh, I want to go b before things changed. Um, mm -hmm. And you're right, there is a frenzy right now, and you could go on the internet, and there's any number of ways that you could travel to Cuba mm -hmm. perfectly legally. I will say that it's not cheap to go. If Cuba was ever cheap, it's not cheap now. You know, restaurants have gotten a lot more expensive. Um, Hotels are not cheap, so so you, you're not going to go unless you're going to go stay in a hostel and you know take buses and do things like that. It's not going to be cheap. But getting back to the idea of going there before things change, I I that that phrase just kind of flummoxes me because I don't really know what it means. Before things change, to what? They're changing from what to what. You know, right now, Cuba is a great tourist destination, undeniably a tremendous tourist destination for culture, for ecology, the environment, for history, um, the food, the food things getting there, music, cigars, all of that. Um, but um, that's just one facet of the country. So when people say, I think it's a nostalgia thing when people say going before it changes because I don't want to see a Starbucks or I don't want to see a Home Depot or I don't want to see things become so Americanized. Okay. Well, first of all, they're very Americanized in many ways, but from the 50s. Um, so that's where the nostalgia factor comes in. But I, I would ask people when they say before things change, to think about that a little more deeply in terms of what that means for the Cubans. Because a tourist might go to Cuba and you see a certain, you see a certain style. You stay in a hotel, uh, you're in a bus. Um, but life in Cuba is very difficult for people. It's very difficult. It's transportation is hard, housing is hard, going to the market and finding food is hard. Um, you know, I have a friend who's, I won't say I'm her peer because she's she's higher up than I am, but she's a curator, senior curator at the National Museum. She makes $35 a month. And for her to get to work sometimes, it takes her two hours because the transportation system is so bad. You know, if something falls in her house and she has to go find a can of paint, it's hard to find a can of paint. You know, she wants to find, uh, say she wants fish, you know, for the weekend she's going to go to the market and to buy a bag of uh, frozen tuna is $10. So there goes almost.